You're watching Global Trade This Week with Pete Mento and Doug Draper. Hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, the next edition of Global Trade This Week. We are now in the month of April. We're in second quarter, and we have a, a dynamite show um, with us today. And I'm Doug Draper, your co-host uh, out in Denver, Colorado, my partner in crime, who is in some hotel room. You can tell by the back uh, by the backdrop, but Pete, thanks for being part of the, the, the Global Trade, and tell us where you are today. Right now, I am in Princeton, New Jersey, and very soon I will be in Hanover or Whippany, New Jersey, to speak for the um, Pharmaceutical Supply Chain Council, which is the largest collection of pharmaceutical and healthcare supply chain security professionals in the world. And we meet annually, and it is uh, truly one of my favorite events to speak at. I've got a lot of friends, a lot of close friends that are, are at this. So nice. um, looking forward to it very much so. Nice. Well, I think, uh, I think our listeners should know that every week, without fail, Doug does not know which one of us is supposed to kick off the show. And when I say every week, I'm not kidding. Every week he asks, so who's starting the show this week, me or you? And I, and I say to him, who, well, who started it last week? And he's like, I don't it's, know. Not like, it's not like we do this once a quarter, Doug. We do it once a week. Mm-hmm. Like you can't think back to the last show and you're like, oh, that's right. Pete did it. I guess it's my turn this time. I just, I'm just swept up in the moment. I'm just so oh. engaged with our topics, um, trying to uh, keep our listeners educated that that's the last thing on my mind. I just want good content and uh, some levity in the show. So um, I, I know next week idea. you'll start. I, I will, Doug, yes. You want to write it down in a post-it note and <laughs> maybe, <laughs> you know. Just second like around my hand. <laughs> Right here. Done. Yeah. It's not a bad idea. Done. Uh, we, we have a big topic, and, and as as always the case, whenever there's just an overwhelmingly large topic, we tag team it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm I am so frustrated with this, Doug. So I'm so excited to talk about it. Yeah, I'm, well, like, I'm, shaking. I'm shaking in my chair. I'm so happy. Uh, I know. Well, I will let you rip it because it is a great topic. We're going to tag team it. You're excited, have plenty of things to say. So Pete, why don't you lead us off? In the wee hours of the morning last Tuesday, a uh, very large container ship um, holding what up, up to 10,000. We don't know precisely how many containers, but around 10,000 containers departed with the tide in the port of Baltimore. And they did so in clear waters, very little wind, and from what I understand, not much of a current either, to uh, depart Baltimore for Sri Lanka. This vessel had um, a major cat- cat- catastrophic incident on board. And as such, even with the pilots on board, even with the hard work of the crew that was on the vessel, struck the key bridge, which is a major thoroughfare for people that live in the Delmarva region. Uh, the 695 bridge, the key bridge, has about 300,000 people a day. Mm. So that's a lot that cross it. And um, the state police showed up just in time to stop traffic. However, a number of people who were working on that bridge, unfortunately fell and and perished. Shockingly, it appears that no one on the ship itself has been hurt uh, or, you know, was, was really hurt. And I, I have two things to say about this immediately, Doug. First of all, I drove up from D.C. yesterday, mm-hmm. and I took the 95 Harbor Tunnel. And as as right as I'm getting, you can see everything. Like, it's it's in the distance, but you can see everything. So you see the bridge that's fallen, uh, and then you, you see what looks like a giant landmass next to it. It's not a giant landmass. It's the ship. And what I, I, th- I think I was more freaked out over anything is you don't really understand, even me, I've been on plenty of ships, just how large these ships really are in comparison to the surroundings. And um, at this point, what I can tell you, and I don't know if you're going to bring this up, Doug, but they did open up a very small channel for barge traffic. They tend to have another one open today and then a third one open, but this will not be big enough for ships. 
Um, and the second thing I wanted to talk about, Doug, is I am beyond. I, I'm I'm pissed off. I'm not I'm not annoyed. I'm not frustrated. I'm pissed off at the number of unqualified, mouth breathing, milk dribbling idiots that have been talking about the what ifs and what I would have done and why didn't the. If you've never set foot and stood a watch on a ship, shut up. Shut up about what should have been done and what could have been done and how irresponsible things were. You don't know what you're talking about. So along those same lines, it is incredibly irresponsible for anyone, including other mariners, to say what could have happened. We don't know yet. The lead investigator for the NTSB is a gentleman named Marcel Muse. He graduated two years after I did from Maine Maritime Academy. And he will get to the bottom of exactly what happened, but it will take a long time to understand precisely what went down. The best we can tell at this point is that the ship lost its plant, that a single screw, single rudder vessel did not have its engineering plant up and running, that when it fell, the backup um, generators that would have gotten steerage back failed as well. When the engine came back on, they backed it down as hard as they could, and that probably blew the plant again. So some simple things, folks. Number one, drop all the anchors you want. It's not a Honda Accord. We don't stomp on the brakes and the ship stops, okay? It keeps on moving. And you're talking about, you know, a ship that weighs tens of thousands of tons. And it's going to keep moving, right? I, I don't know if anyone else took basic physics, but they're floating. They're moving in one direction. And unless there's some massive tractor tugs that they could have taken, which they didn't, by the way, and I don't believe Baltimore has, it wouldn't have mattered. You could put a tug up against that thing, go as hard as you want. Most of the tugs that were available in Maryland wouldn't have done a damn thing about it. Should they have left under tug power? Don't know. We'll find out when this report comes out. Should we make sure that ships have tugs when they go under major bridges? Probably. Yeah, I think that's probably going to be a requirement now. For, you know, ships going under the Tappan Zee or under the bridges in San Diego or Virginia. But honestly, Doug, the number of people from news people to just idiot talking heads saying what they think should have been done. Shut up. Mm -hmm. I've had it, man. Now, I'll let you talk before I get to the economic side of it. But I get I, I got I mean, all weekend I'm, I'm talking to farmers who are telling me what, what the pilots should have done. And I spent most of my week talking to pilots, people that graduated with me from the academy who do this every day. And they were very honest with me. Ships lose plants. And they've, they've beat ships. They have they've themselves hit things. It's not as simple as people think it is. And that's why these guys get paid millions of dollars to do that job. Mm -hmm. I'll stop, I know, Doug, I'll take it over if I don't stop talking. So. <laughs> Yeah, well, in this day and age, Pete, there has to be somebody to blame, right? A yes. system, uh, uh, an individual of some sort. And for the uneducated um, uh, consumer, that's lack of a better term, thinks that this should stop like a car, right? Um, hey, just put the brakes on. Drop the anchor. What's the big deal? Um, so there's uh, uneducated folks making their opinions. And in this day and age, there has to be a blame passed around. And it's not just an accident, right? So you're well more versed in that topic. The, the, um, the angle I want to take is that, and we've talked about this, Pete, the connectors, right, is what happens after that vessel? Not the one that, that got damaged. I'm talking about the ones that can no longer get into the port, yeah. right? There are warehouses, there's longshoremen, there's trucking companies, all of the people that connect to move that freight off of the vessel into commerce uh, all over the country. Where's the conversation uh, about those folks, right? I've seen a few things, but there's warehouses, you know, that's my industry, that are empty. There are truckers that are trying to figure out where they're going to go next. Um, and the uncertainty of when is this going to be up and running again, there's people there that have to put food on the table, um, that have commitments, that need to take care of their families and have bills to pay. And the uncertainty of what what do I do now, right? So. I think that's the missing story. Yes, you just spoke to, on the, the, the damage. I think that they'll get that thing pretty cleaned up relatively quickly. 
right? Um, as far as the ability to have at least one channel safely to navigate. But I think the real story needs to be on what about all the support network and the infrastructure and the connectors that aren't being spoke about that are truly being impacted, right? So I, I want the spotlight to be to be um, uh, to be focused there. And 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 what can we, the state, the port? I don't know who it would be, but there needs to be more dialogue on how do we support that group of people because the connectors are as important. How do you get a boat in and out, right? A vessel in and out. I don't know. Have you had any thoughts? Well, take yeah, on that? Well, I mean, there's been a lot reported on this. So according to G Captain, Governor Hogan in Maryland is setting aside money for a couple hundred thousand people whose livelihood depends on the port in order to help them to get through this. It's not going to be nearly enough money. But if, if you start looking beyond the port, there's all the diesel, you know, diesel stop offs for trucks. There's the restaurants that depend mm -hmm. on it's it's upwards of almost 200,000 people whose jobs depend on that port. Uh, the port itself is the ninth largest port in America, but it's the largest row row port. So mm -hmm. it's a massive port for cars uh, coming on and off these, you know, Willenia uh, lines and other other ships. It's also the largest sugar port in America. So a significant amount of the sugar that is imported into America comes in through Baltimore, very specialized kind of port, same thing with salt in order to move the food grade stuff. It's not like we can just shift that someplace else easily. Mm -hmm. And there's also a lot of military sea lift command vessels. There's a lot of ships that are in that harbor now that can't leave that are part of the American sea lift story on getting things in and out um, in order to help defend the United States, which right now are essentially abandoned and, and can't move in and out. All of this brought together is, is a major economic issue for America. Ships are being told that they're going to call on Norfolk and New York mostly to make up for the difference. Ocean carriers, one of them said, I know it's supposed to go to Baltimore, but we're terminating the voyage in New York. So once it stops in New York, you've got to get it to Baltimore. It's it's going to cost you to take care of that. That's gone over super well with mm -hmm. the uh, shipping community. And the second mm -hmm. half of it, it's gone over super well, the shipping community is calling it force majeure. And it's probably going to be a general average claim, which means that this is going to cost a lot of money for people who had containers on that ship to get them out. And the ship owner is doing everything they can to limit their own liability. As you would imagine, uh, there'd be a lot of this going on about who's mm -hmm. going to pay for what that bridge, when it was constructed in 2022 dollars cost around $400 million to make. So imagine what it's going to cost now. And it's not going to take months or quarters to rebuild that bridge. It's going to take years mm -hmm. and that's going to be a disruption to the channel as well. So yes, we'll clear the, the parts of the bridge that fell. We'll get that ship out of the way. Um, but you're going to have years of disruption of human traffic and then years of disruption of ships traffic as they rebuild that bridge. This is mm -hmm. a big problem. And it's funny, Doug, just last week I, I was giving a seminar and I said, I've been you know working on a report where what would happen if a major oil tanker was was damaged or attacked in the approach into Houston Harbor, Galveston Harbor, or New Orleans Harbor, or all three. Not being able to use one of our ports is one thing, but a strategic port where most of our oil refining is, or a strategic port where a tremendous amount of our Navy comes in and out of, then it becomes an entirely different subject, Doug. Mm -hmm. And you can't just bring a ship in and out of a port. There are lanes that have been dredged properly for the size of these vessels. So um, all around, this is a catastrophe, a financial one and a logistics one. And these connectors that you talked, you know, you brought up the, the term, they're severely damaged over what happened here. Good news is, if there is any good news, the, um, you know, current East Coast traffic is way down. So I don't think the ports are going to have a hard time picking up the extra stuff. But you mm -hmm. want to talk about bad news, Doug? We're looking down the barrel of an East Coast port strike. Mm. And you want to talk about having leverage as as the uh, <coughs> leverage as the as the labor unions couldn't get much better leverage than this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the the absorption of the ports it reminded me of uh, when Yellow filed for bankruptcy, and yeah. you know it's a I don't know if it was three billion or five billion dollar company, but the amount of freight that they were controlling that was just absorbed in the net, in the network from other uh, LTL companies, and there wasn't really a blip. 
I think we're going to see a little bit of that, like you just said, on, on the East Coast, which, um, you know, goes back to the things that you and I have spoken about related to, to L.A. And, and how it's back. L.A.'s back, baby. So, L.A.'s uh, back. You know, Doug, L.A. You, is back, baby. It's you, prime you brought time. Up that point in the beginning. Sorry, I'm talking over you. I, I no, no, no. Fired up, bro. The, you know, the human toll on people's livelihoods this is a port. And ports, as connectors go, you don't get much bigger than a major ocean port, right? Maybe some airports, um, certain border crossings. The, the disruption and the human toll on people's livelihoods, the disruption of the supply chain, just the anguish and the panic that set in when this happened. I, I was in Pennsylvania yesterday, every yeah, last week. Every customer that I spent time with uses the Port of Baltimore. Mm -hmm. And they, they were looking for answers. And answers in a situation like this are slow coming. And nobody wants to speculate because we don't want to give people false hope or no hope. We want to give them the God's honest truth of what we're hearing. Mm -hmm. So giving that to people has been very hard. It's getting better. Um, but for everybody out there, you know, talk to your NVO, talk to the ocean carriers, stay up to date on what's happening because it does change every day. And, um, you know, we'll all get through this together. But wearing my O's hat, I lived in Baltimore for quite some time when I was a comic. And, um, you know, it's a city that's got enough problems, Doug. I didn't need another one. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, um, let's shift the gears. Let's talk about halftime. We tag team the first topic, and we're going to kind of tag team the, the, the halftime. Obviously, halftime is brought to us by Cap Logistics. We can't thank them enough for uh, facilitating this weekly show, and uh, we encourage you to visit caplogistics.com. Um, yeah, so Troubled, um, it's start of baseball season. So I have a different take on baseball, but they're both baseball-related. So um, – Trying to think who should go first on this one. Let, let, let me jump in real quick, Pete, because mine's short and sweet, um, and it's related to the Oakland A's. So not only did they have five errors in three innings yesterday, um, they are now ejecting from the Bay Area and, uh, and moving down to Las Vegas. I did not realize this, Pete, but where they are going to put the uh, new baseball stadium is where the Tropicana uh, Casino is located. Yep. And... Um, that is pretty interesting for a couple of reasons. I think today or this week, they're kind of shutting it down. They're not destroying it. They're not going to level it until October, but they're getting everybody. You can't check into the Tropicana anymore, Pete. <laughs> um, and I just thought, and my wife made a comment. I can't even, I told her I was going to quote it today, um, but it was something related to when you think of the 1940s and 50s in Vegas, the Tropicana was always brought up, right? That was kind of like one of the, Oh, she said Circus Circus is a shit show. Um, <laughs> but the Tropicana, from her memory, was, you know, kind of glamorous back then. So the Tropicana is pretty close to the airport. It's right across kind of catty corner from the Luxor south of the Strip. And um, that's not supposed to be completed until 2028, at least from what I read. So demolition starts in October. Uh, the, uh, the stadium will be done in 2028. Kind of looks a little bit like the Sydney Opera House, which I think is going to be a really cool uh, architectural design. But the question is, what's going to go on with the Oakland A's in the next couple of years? Because they're horrible. People are frustrated. Players are frustrated. The organization's frustrated. But just wait until it gets to Vegas. Everything will be fixed. So that's my baseball baseball take on it today. Um, Pete, I don't know if you have any comments on that, or we just flip yeah, over yeah. your, your halftime. Yeah, I'm, I'm a... Uh... My old friend Ed Quas, I used to work with, used to call me a baseball poet. You know, I love baseball so much. It's, it's, um, it's. I, I romanticize the sport when it's just a game. Uh, I love baseball. I always have since I was a little kid. And one of my favorite places to go to watch a game for the dumbest reason was Oakland. So Oakland and Milwaukee both let you tailgate in the parking lot, and I think that's pretty awesome. You know, I, I grew up going to Rangers games, which. Uh, I only went when the Red Sox came to town. My dad would take me to Red Sox games. And then I am a season ticket holder for my lowly, miserable team, which beat the A's last night. Thank you for those errors. Uh, but it was always fun to go there and hang out in the parking lot and, you know, drink beers and barbecue with people. I really liked that. And I like that about um, Milwaukee as well. But I'm excited, Doug, for them to go to Vegas. Yeah. I'm excited. Uh, 
And I think the reason for that is uh, I haven't done it yet, but I'm looking forward to going to an NFL game in Las Vegas. I've got to imagine that's a crap ton of fun to go with your boys and, and go to that cathedral of, of the NFL. And if this new stadium is anything like that football stadium, I think it's going to be incredible. Mm-hmm. But Doug, I know that you guys are in the mountain mountain time zone and you consider yourselves like your own region, but I don't know how to break it to you, but the rest of the world thinks of you all as West Coast people, right? Um, yes, pretty much. Yeah, I'm sure bothers everyone in Colorado, seeing as how much you love Californians. Yeah. Uh, are you a Vegas guy? Because that can't be too far of a flight for you all. No, it, uh, so you are correct. Um, it is not too far. I don't, an hour, hour 15, something like that. Wow. Okay. Hour and a half. I don't really know. Somebody can, uh, our listeners can make a comment on that, but it's like two hours to LA. So hour and a half, maybe to, uh, to Vegas. Um, yeah, you know, I go to Vegas. I don't gamble. Doesn't, you know, w- whatever, but I go to Vegas to check out the shows and all the other stuff that's in that, that's involved. And, you know, I, I've always said 48 hours in Vegas, you get, then you got to get the hell out of there or you start spiraling big time. So yeah, yeah I, I'll hit Vegas once a year. That's about it. So I'm not, I'm not hardcore, but the cool thing about all these sports teams popping up there is it just adds to a destination. You and your buddies are going to go. I guarantee as soon as that, um, that stadium opens, Pete, you and a bunch of your drunk buddies from, Boston are going to drive or fly Absolutely. cross country to, to tear it up and watch a game. Everybody is going to do that. And it's going to pump more into the economy. And all of us are betting on sports legally now, you know, so yeah. what better place than Vegas. Uh, I, I said once, one time to a friend of mine in new Orleans that Las Vegas is like new Orleans without the great food, the history, the culture, the music. He's like, so it's nothing like Vegas or nothing like new Orleans. I said, you know what? You're right. It's nothing like new Orleans at all. But there are there are people who are just Vegas people. You know, they love going, they love the casinos. I want to go to that Sphere thing. So I think to me, like the ultimate weekend would be seeing a band I love at the Sphere and then going and watching a baseball game. And I'm I'm really looking forward to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's exactly. And then uh, they just got to get basketball there. But you know, I was thinking, you remember the UNLV running Rebels with Jerry Tarkanian, and they had all those uh, players back in the early 90s. Cheating, right? They were betting oh, on stuff. Didn't they? That was basically uh, pro ball uh, <laughs> in Vegas back in the day. What was that? Larry Johnson, Stacy Ogman. Um, I'm dating myself with all that. Plastic Man, Grandmama. Anyway, that's the one piece. And it will come. There'll be some team they'll pull or be an expansion. Some but uh, Yeah. Yeah, awesome. we'll have to go, Doug. It'll have to be a show field trip. Yeah, yes. yeah. <laughs> that would be that would be awesome. So good. All right. Well, that was halftime. Brought to you by no, Cap Logistics. I haven't done mine, Doug. What? I haven't done my halftime. I thought we just talked about it. No, I, I have a very specific topic with baseball on halftime. All right. I apologize. I thought we covered both of them. Go for it. I um I was watching the news this week, and they reported that. The Chicago White Sox, who are trying very hard to get people to come watch games in Chicago. Because, you know, you got the Cubs there, and the Cubs are a lot of fun to go see, you know, an old Wrigley Field. It's kind of like Fenway. People want to go watch baseball in a crappy old stadium. Um, the the White Sox, not so nice. My least favorite ballpark in the entire country, by the way, is Colorado. I, it, it is not a fun experience for baseball mm. fans. All right. So for – Chicago, they have a $40 s'mores milkshake, <laughs> 40 bucks. And it wow. is big and, you know, it's got like burnt marsh- marshmallows on it and crap. And, but there's not even any booze in it, you know. I, I love going to Fenway and eating crappy hot dogs and drinking my now $12 beers, Doug, $12 mm. bucks. Um, and peanuts. So at Fenway, there's a small family-owned cart in front of fam- Fenway where you can buy your peanuts and you're allowed to walk in with them mm-hmm. that you buy there. And it's still five bucks for a giant bag of salted peanuts. And one of my favorite things to do is just shell peanuts, drink beer and waste my life for a couple hours and watch a baseball game. But I, I've never, you know, eaten the sushi at Fenway. I don't do the meatballs and all that other stuff. Yeah, I'm, I'm still pretty, pretty standard. So Doug, are there, are there any foods that you do when you go to a baseball game? Um, you know, here in, uh, Coors Field, it's called the Rocky Dog, and it's like a 
foot long and it's got peppers and all kinds of stuff on it. Um, so I would say that, that that's a gimme. I don't even know how much it is. It's probably 12 bucks, $15. But a Rocky dog would probably be the one. And there, there are places where you can grab a bag of peanuts and um, a bottle of water and bring it into the stadium. So you're right, five bucks, two bucks for a bottle of water and five bucks for a bag of peanuts. And, and you're in, in your seat enjoying life for $7. We have clam chowder at football and baseball games because, you know, New England. Yeah, I'm racking my brain trying to think of a truly Colorado other than, you know, weed gummies. I can't think of anything else that's really a Colorado food. Yeah, well, it's the Rocky Dog, I think, would probably be the most. But I'm sure you go to certain areas in the club level, there's all kinds of weird stuff. But uh, I'm usually in the 300 level yelling and listening to the drunks, um, you know, awesome. scream at their team and how terrible the Rockies are. And they are. They are. Awful. They're almost as bad as the Red Sox. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. And it's well, funny that fun. those those two teams were in the uh, uh, World Series maybe they a were. decade ago. We, they were, and we kicked your ass, Doug. We wow. kicked your ass. It was yeah. it was a great World Series for for Red Sox fans. No stress at all. We knew we were going to roll all over you, and we did. Yeah. 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 That, so. that, that's the the story of that season is the lead up to it, and how the Rockies almost didn't make the playoffs, swept all the way to the to the. Uh, uh, World Series and didn't play for like 11 days because they swept their last team. And that, that was the killer. No, they, the uh, killer was David Ortiz and Manny Ramirez. And <laughs> Peter Martinez and, yeah. And, and, uh, and a guy named Jonathan Papelbon that, that closed you guys out. Like, Oh, team. I remember that guy. Yeah. Oh yeah. God. I love that team. Anyhow, yeah. that was halftime, Doug. I know we got a hard stop here in a little while. So yeah, we get yeah. On to our, uh, our next topic. So my, my first topic of the second half, it's pretty short, but it's terrifying. So the the um, the United States Trade Representative has done a lot of work on behalf of presidents, the last three, as a matter of fact, to create what we call countervailing duties and anti-dumping duties. Mm-hmm. An anti-dumping duty is when a a country's entire right in, in t- entire um, organized organized manufacturing of something is reviewed, and individual companies within that industry are hit with an additional duty. And it's usually a lot because they're dumping product into America. They're selling it at a price that isn't fair to try to drive out domestic competition. Countervailing duties are when the entire industry, not individual businesses get hit. And over the past three presidents, there have been a lot of anti-dumping and countervailing suits, uh, more than probably all the other presidents combined. But this latest one is terrifying. So it's on pardon me, um, aluminum and steel uh, extrusions. So think of brackets and those kinds of things. And they're saying that if, if that's a part in a machine, you're going to have to break out that part if it's Chinese origin. So let's say something was made in Mexico, but there are Chinese origin steel extrusions. You got to break that out of the build of material and pay the additional tariff on it. Hmm. This is going to be a nightmare for importers. It's going to keep Uncle Pete pretty darn busy helping people to work on it. But that's just how nasty we're getting at trying to find ways to stop China from dumping these things into our economy. And I think it's going to be some pretty, um, you know, some, some hard rows to hoe for our friends in the import community for quite a while managing this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it would slow things down. I was on, I was unaware of, of that detail. So you have a machine and five little bolts inside of there came, came from China and you got to peel it apart and line item the, the, the duty on it. So, um, yeah, it just seems, you know, uh, cut off your nose to spite your face, if that's the right terminology, that it's just going to add complexity to the movement of goods um, through the, the supply chain. But if that's the direction that the U.S. government wants to go, then so be it. But it just seems like it's going to stop, slow down. There's going to be confusion and things could change uh, after the election. Who knows? Well, uh, got to give it to importers, buddy. They always find a way to to track this stuff. They always find a way, usually through the help of our industry, to find some way to manage it. And I'm sure we will again. It's just not going to be pleasant. It's not going to be fun. And it's mm-hmm. going to cost people a lot of money, bud. Yeah, yeah, good. Well, my right, topic... Take us home. Yeah, and so I'm just going to brush over this topic as we could go, you know, really, really deep on it. But But my final topic is related to housing. Pete, you and I both sold our homes. I've bought a home. 
I've learned more about real estate, the do's and the don'ts, uh, probably more of the don'ts uh, in the last six months than I ever have in my life. And all that being said, I think there is going to be a housing boom that's going to start at the end of this year. And it's going to be very prevalent in 2025, and it is going to lift our industry. And the reason being, uh, Pete, is that, as you know, the interest rates, all that kind of stuff, they're on a um, no more increases, potential decreases at the end of the year. People are realizing that a 3.25% mortgage rate is not coming back anytime soon. And when that, in, when that mortgage rate bumps into the fives, there's going to be a lot of pent up demand, very similar to what you and I spoke about um, maybe a year ago about the roaring 20s when there was pent up demand and people were buying stuff during the pandemic. And then uh, when the pandemic was over, people wanted experiences, vacations, going out to dinner, all that kind of stuff. And it was a massive explosion of commerce uh, in the services aspect of it. When that interest rate drops to five, high fives does not need to be low fives, in my opinion. The building industry is going to go crazy, multifamily homes, but also remodels where people are going to tap into the equity in their home and they're going to redo this, that or the other. And all of that stuff that's going into your home, whether it's a new build or whether it's a new sink or tile or whatever is delivered via truck and it's imported and it's manufactured in the U.S. and things have to be moved. So I think you're going to see uh, our industry really uh, spike and skyrocket in a positive way for the economy in 2025. And the other person, Pete, my last topic on this one, or my last comment, um, is, a, is a guy that you and I know named Brad Jacobs, who has taken industries that are segmented, ripe for growth, and potential for acquisition, taking that industry and bringing it together. He did it with XBO. He did it with Trash. And now he's doing it in the building materials industry for the same reasons, I believe, that he sees down the road related to that. So we could go down a couple different verticals and parallels on that topic. But I think the building, there, there's going to be a building boom that will grow at the end of this year. 2025 is going to be an explosion. And if you are touching or involved with moving building materials and remodel things, which is a lot of stuff, just look around your home. Uh, it's going to buoy our uh, industry, and it's going to be a banner 2025, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I don't disagree, Doug. I think um, really two points to make here. The first is say what you will about the millennials, uh, and there's a lot of people that have a lot of negative things to say, but they they grew up in a world craving stability, and millennials have probably been hit harder than any generation, maybe in our lifetime, with the, the rise of the cost of housing associated also with renting and then trying to get money put together to put down a down payment for one of these homes. And they've really had a hard time sort of grasping that American dream. And I think that when it becomes more within reach, you're going to see that particular generation leap at the opportunity. And it will be a part of that resurgence of a building boom. Americans love to build houses. We love we love building. We have still plenty of dirt in this country. Maybe not where you want it, but plenty of dirt in this country. And I think you're going to see a lot of those houses built. So I completely agree with you, Doug. And then the second half that I agree with you with as well is a lot of building materials are imported. I was in Lancaster, PA last week, and I, I don't ever remember being there, Doug, but beautiful homes, absolutely beautiful homes from the turn of the century that are everywhere. And it, it was because of just the craftsmanship that was available from Amish carpenters um, mm -hmm. and a lot of people that were in the building trades, manufacturing material for the building trades. All those companies are still there doing hardwood flooring, uh, you know, all the components that go into a new home. I think that they're ripe. You know, they're just they're waiting to leap on that next opportunity. And it is going to be a, a renaissance in American architecture, American building and American home ownership. And I, I'm looking forward to it because. I think that's an important part of getting to be an American is owning a home to be taxed on for the rest of your life. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. Well, the government taxing, I think, is a great way to end the show. Yeah, yeah. So we want to thank everybody for uh, joining us again on a, another uh, Cracker Jack. You like that baseball call back then? Love it. The Love edition it. of Global Trade this week. Uh, thanks to all of our friends at Cap Logistics for continuing to financially support us and logistically support us. Thanks to Keenan 
who, um, you know, I, I don't know. He's living like a yurt somewhere, isn't he? I don't know what his deal is. Well, he had an interesting experience last Friday, to say the least. Yeah, he sure did. We'll save that for another show. <laughs> we'll just leave it um, at that. Yeah, we'll leave it at that. But thanks to Keenan back in the booth. And thanks to all of you for listening. Uh, hit subscribe. Tell your friends. And if it's happening in Global Trade, we'll talk about it next week on Global Trade this week. Thanks, buddy. Excellent. Take care. Thanks, Pete.